The popularity of the musical Hamilton has brought some attention to some lesser known figures of the American Revolution. The uniquely named Hercules Mulligan certainly conjures an image, but actually relatively little is known about the actual person behind that image. We know that Hercules Mulligan was an early supporter of the Patriot cause, that he was a major influence on the thinking of Alexander Hamilton, that he was a tailor and a spy whose work saved George Washington from capture by the British twice. But relatively little remains of his own writings, and what we know of him really comes from the works of others. Still, the role he played in the American Revolution was important, a role that deserves to be remembered. Hercules was born in Northern Ireland to Hugh and Sarah Mulligan in 1740. The family immigrated to the United States in 1746, where they settled in New York City. Hercules attended King's College in New York City and later opened a successful haberdashery, a shop specializing in selling men's clothes, catering specifically to British officers. In 1773, he married Elizabeth Sanders, the niece of Admiral Charles Sanders of the British Navy. Mulligan seems to have been charismatic and well-liked, and he quickly developed a rapport with wealthy clients. In October of 1772, Hercules was introduced by his brother Hugh to a young boy from the Caribbean, Alexander Hamilton. Hercules helped put Hamilton in a grammar school before the boy planned to apply to Princeton. When Hamilton ended up attending King's College instead, Hercules offered him a room in New York City. In 1765, the British had passed the Stamp Act, which required that printed materials like legal documents, magazines, playing cards, newspapers, and more had to be printed on paper produced in London that carried an embossed revenue stamp. The Sons of Liberty formed first in Boston to fight the Act, using the motto, No Taxation Without Representation. Mulligan joined the loosely organized society in New York City and helped organize a newspaper that the British quickly banned. The Stamp Act provoked a wave of condemnation throughout the colonies from a broad spectrum of society, dramatically fanning anti-crown sentiment. It was repealed less than a year after it was passed. In 1770, Hercules was involved with another early revolutionary event, the Battle of Golden Hill. After the Stamp Act was repealed, the Sons of Liberty set up a Liberty Pole, tall pole, often with a vein on top, whose origin and symbolism actually goes back to Roman times, in a park to celebrate. The British chopped it down. So the sons put up another. This continued until the sons put up one that was strengthened with iron bands. The British attempted to destroy it several times, but failed. The sons said that cutting this post down can only be done to affront all the sons of liberty. The perpetrators would do well to consider the consequences. People will not tamely submit to such a mean, low-lived insult on their liberty. The poll stood until January 16, 1770. Friction between the soldiers and the locals bubbled over, this time because of the Quartering Act, forcing the city to provide housing to the soldiers. The British managed to split the pole with explosives on the night of the 15th and deposited the chopped, mangled pieces at a tavern the sons frequented. Outraged, the sons declared that the soldiers out at night shall be treated as enemies to the peace of this city. In response, soldiers began posting a bill calling the sons the real enemies to society. Two of the soldiers were apprehended and brought to the mayor for punishment. Soldiers from the barracks arrived shortly after to retrieve them, but a crowd had gathered to prevent them. Hercules had helped to rouse the city. The soldiers withdrew, closely followed by the crowd, lest they might offer violence to any passerby. They followed the soldiers to a narrow passage called Golden Hill. It was while they were there that another group of soldiers appeared behind them. While the second group did not attack, the first took heart and turned on the unarmed colonists. The commander gave the order, Soldiers, draw your bayonets and cut your way through. Several people were injured in the fighting that lasted two days. Following the clash, which happened six weeks prior to the more famous Boston Massacre, the Sons purchased a plot of land near where the last pole had stood and erected another. This one sunk deep and covered with iron bands up most of its body. At its top was a gilt vein that bore the inscription, Liberty and Property. Mulligan was deeply involved with the Sons of Liberty at this time, even though his specific role in many of these events is still unclear. What is clear is that despite the clientele for his shop and his family connections through his wife, he was still a committed patriot. While Hamilton lived with Hercules, the house was a hotbed of revolutionary discussion, and many of Hamilton's ideas about independence were shaped by that discussion. Mulligan was a part of the New York Committee of Correspondence that formed in 1774 to respond to the closure of Boston's port after the Boston Tea Party. This committee helped to put together the first Continental Congress, and afterward functioned as a quasi-government meant to enforce the boycott of British trade. By the eve of war, these committees were often acting as shadow governments for their respective colonies. 
Only a few months after the war began, Hercules joined Hamilton, who was leading the volunteer militia formed at King's College, to secure the artillery at the Battery, a fortification which overlooked the Hudson River. British soldiers and the HMS Asia lay in wait the night the militia came and opened fire as they were attempting to drag the weapons down the street. During the fighting, Hamilton gave Hercules his musket, which Hercules then abandoned. When Hamilton later asked for it back, Hercules told him what happened and watched Hamilton calmly go back for it, notwithstanding the firing. On July 9, 1776, after the first reading of the Declaration of Independence to Washington's men, Hercules was with the crowd that went to Bowling Green Park and pulled down a statue of George III, which they then melted into 42,088 musket balls. Hercules helped Hamilton get a commission in the army, which led to his eventual position on Washington's staff. The British fought Washington in and around New York during the summer of 1776, eventually forcing Washington to retreat and capturing New York City on September 15th. Hercules attempted to leave the city with Washington's withdrawal with his family, but was intercepted by William Cunningham, the new provost marshal in charge of the British police. Cunningham and Hercules likely knew each other, may have had previous altercations. Cunningham, who would become notorious for his treatment of prisoners, had Hercules arrested. But he was eventually released, in no small part due to his ability to maintain his good humor and all his connections to British higher-ups. In two months, he was back at his shop, doing business. Washington saw early the need for good intelligence against his better armed and prepared foe, and put Benjamin Tolomage in charge of managing his spy network. When Washington mentioned to his staff he was looking for a spy in New York, Hamilton knew just the man for the job. In fact, Hamilton had already met with Hercules at least once since the retreat from New York City. Hercules became affiliated with the famous Culper Ring, although he acted primarily as a lone agent with help from his slave and faithful accomplice, Cato. Hercules worked closely with his friend Roger Townsend, who lived nearby, who went by the codename Samuel Culper Jr. While he was never referred to by name, Hercules was described as a faithful friend and one of the first characters of the city. Just becoming a spy was an incredibly brave act. Spy Nathan Hale had been hanged by the British without trial just a week after the British took the city. Hercules was in an ideal position to spy for the Americans, with access to British officers who often had wine with the tailor during their appointments. Hercules was also perceptive and good at gleaning important information from benign details. He determined in 1777 that General Howe planned to move a significant force south based on uniform orders, a movement that culminated in Howe's assault on Philadelphia. In the winter of 1779, he may have saved Washington's life, and by extension the whole war, when a British officer came by late one night to buy a watch coat. When Hercules asked him why he needed it so late, the officer said, Before another day, we'll have the rebel general in our hands. Hercules immediately sent the information, likely via Cato, to Alexander Hamilton. Washington had been planning to meet with some of his officers, and the British apparently had learned where that meeting was going to occur. And because of Hercules' mulligan, Washington changed his plans. Hercules reported troop movements by keeping track of when certain officers needed to pick up their repaired uniforms. The British weren't concerned when Cato would arrive at their lines, looking to pass through with parcels labeled H. Mulligan. He was allowed to pass back and forth as needed. He made a point to work with Haim Solomon, a Polish-born patriot who was working as a translator between the British and the German Hessians, to draw Hessian officers into his shop as well. Solomon also passed Hercules information he learned on the job through Cato. Hercules also helped Solomon escape from the provost prison after he was sentenced to death in 1778. The Culper Ring was successful as well, providing important information on British plans to attack the French army shortly after it arrived in Rhode Island. It's unknown what part Hercules might have played in gathering that information, but in 1781 he certainly did provide another piece of vital information. Hercules' brother, Hugh, worked with a shipping company, which was asked to load provisions for 300 cavalry. He was able to learn that the British had discovered that Washington was going to travel along the coast from his camp to meet with French General Rochambeau. Washington was saved once again. The work was not without its dangers. The provost was determined to put an end to the spying and kept a close eye on Hercules' shop. When he noticed that Cato was frequently gone, he intercepted Cato on a return trip and beat him reportedly with much cruelty. But Cato refused to give up anything. But Hercules' luck seemed to have run out when Benedict Arnold deserted the Americans for the British. Arnold came to New York City, and Mulligan was arrested on suspicion of spying shortly after. His arrest greatly disturbed fellow spy Robert Townsend, who said several of our dear friends have been imprisoned, in particular one who has been ever serviceable to this correspondence. 
During one of his stints in the provost's prison, Circulus saw another prisoner, most inhumanely beat by the provost marshal. Despite the suspicion, however, Hercules was released again several months later. Unfortunately for Hercules, when the war ended in victory for the Americans, he was not immediately recognized as a patriot, and he feared that he might face reprisals from New Yorkers, who thought he'd been too cozy with the British soldiers. Washington led his army down Broadway on November 25th, 1783. He conspicuously ate breakfast with Hercules the next morning, making sure to thank him for his work. After the war, Washington would patronize Hercules' shop frequently. In 1785, he and Hamilton were two of the founding members of the New York Manumission Society, which advocated for the abolition of slavery, especially in New York. But it is unknown what happened to Hercules' slave Cato, though he is now recognized as a black patriot. Hercules prospered in the New America as a tailor, had eight children, and retired comfortably in 1820. He died five years later. It is, I suppose, fitting that a man who spent many years as a spy remains an enigma. Very little of the writings of Hercules Mulligan survived, although he did pen a short biography of his friend Alexander Hamilton. But Hercules' exact actions and the actions of his even more enigmatic friend and slave Cato are sometimes difficult to pin down during the war, but it's clear that they played a central role in gathering intelligence in New York City and getting that intelligence out of the city. And their contributions are perhaps best seen in the broader tapestry of revolution and resistance of the time. In an era of extreme danger, Hercules Mulligan chose the more perilous path, as did so many, whose lives and contributions deserve to be remembered. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy, short snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long. And if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section. I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow The History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on forgotten history, all you need to do is subscribe.